Joy King, today's guest, is the Chief Advancement Officer of Be The Match and Executive Director of its foundation. Her philanthropic work helps patients get cellular therapy, live healthier lives, and offers hope for a cure to thousands more in need. She'll share insights about her work and her superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show, where we empower you. Joy, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. I look so forward to getting to know you better and the amazing work that you're doing with Be The Match. Thank you for having me. Kelly, why don't you take just a minute, just for the sake of kind of framing our discussion, to give us an overview of the work of Be The Match, the National Marrow Donor Program. Sure, I'd love to. Our mission here at the NMDP Be The Match is pretty simple. It's to save lives through cellular therapy. And our vision is equal outcomes for all. And what that means, Devin, is every day we recruit members to our registry. We call it the greatest waiting list in the world. And we work with patients who have been diagnosed with a blood cancer or blood disorder and need either a bone marrow or a blood stem cell transplant to cure their disease. So those, we work with those patients and we match them to a living donor on our registry. And once that match happens, we go to wherever in the world the donor is and we collect their bone marrow or their blood stem cells and we carry it in our two little hands and deliver it to wherever in the world the patient needs it. And the entire time that that's happening, we are funding research to improve outcomes for patients. We are advocating on their behalf at the state and federal level, and we are raising critical funds to ensure that we can remove any barriers that exist for our patients to get to transplant, but also our donors to be able to donate their life-saving bone marrow or their blood stem cells. So it's kind of the greatest job in the world. (laughs) <laughs> it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Not many people get to save as many lives as you get to save every day. As <clears throat> One of the things you shared with me in advance of this conversation was that traditionally uh, the access to a blood marrow match is not equal. Uh, and, and that really is probably surprising to a lot of people that you know, if you're a, a white person, it, it's uh, I think you told me it's 79 percent. Right. And if it's if you're an African-American, it, it, it's only about 29 percent. Tell me a little bit about what's creating that situation and what you're doing to address it. Sure. So we. The reason that is, is because traditionally, at least for the last 30 plus years since we've been around, your donor, um, if you're a patient that's searching for a donor, is likely to come from the same ancestry as you. So, you know, someone with European descent, it's likely that your donor also has European descent. And as our world and our country gets more and more diverse, it's harder and harder to find patients and donors that have the exact same HLA, which is what we match on. It's a part of your DNA that kind of signals your ancestry. And that's why there's such a huge disparity. In fact, it may be the largest disparity that exists in modern medicine, you know, that 80 to 30 So there's a few ways that we're tackling this. One, we know that we will not be able to register our way out of this, meaning we will never be able to add enough people on our registry to eliminate the disparity alone. The registry is critically important and the a very young healthy registry is important because we know young donors provide better outcomes for patients. So that's critical. You know, if you're between 18 and 30, we really want you to consider joining the registry. The other way we're tackling this, and it's proving to be very, very, very successful, is through research. And so several years ago, um, there was a movement um, in the transplant community to match patients with a half-matched family member. 
So maybe a child that is a half match or a parent if they were young and healthy or a brother or sister um, that was a half match with a certain type of chemotherapy for the patient. And we were seeing really good outcomes. So the thought was, if that was happening in the related setting with a family member, why couldn't that happen in an unrelated setting? Because over 70% of patients don't have a suitable related donor, someone in their family that can donate to them. And so <clears throat> about, oh, I don't know, a little over five years ago, we started a, a trial to see if this same thing would work in the unrelated donor setting, meaning um, we consider a perfect match an eight out of eight match. So we were looking at a seven out of eight, six out of eight, so on and so forth. And we started to see that the outcomes for patients who were using a less than eight out of eight donor were similar. The outcomes, the survival rates were similar to those patients that had a perfectly matched donor. And so we've been getting better and better over time, answering more and more questions. And it won't surprise anyone if you think about it and think about the disparity that I just talked about, that the majority of patients that are benefiting from these trials are patients who are ethnically diverse. So the majority of patients that are participating in this trial and seeing good outcomes are those patients who otherwise wouldn't have an option on the donor registry. So it will completely change our ability to ensure that every patient can receive their life-saving therapy when they need us, which is incredible. It is exciting. What do you see as being the timeline to making this process more generally available? That's another great question. So it has been one of the main initiatives for our organization the past five years, and it will continue to be um, a priority for the organization over the next five years. So we're just completing a five-year strategic plan where we've seen significant success. We're serving more patients than we've ever served before. And because of this trial, um, we believe we'll be able to serve at least 10,000 patients a year by the year 2028, where this past year we served over 7,000. So a significant increase in the number of patients that we'll be able to serve, not because of this trial alone, but in a huge part because of this trial and um, just being able to provide hope and more options for patients who otherwise wouldn't have one. Nice. This is exciting. Game changing, isn't it? It really is. It's incredible. Yeah. What are the other things going on now at Be The Match that excite you? There's a lot that go on at Be The Match that excite me. One of the things that is also helping us solve our ability to serve every patient is the um, expansion of our work on historically Black colleges and universities across the U.S. And our focus there has been to engage with the administration as well as the student population by hiring paid interns to educate the student body and recruit um, more young, healthy donors to our donor registry, specifically in the Black and African American population, so the, the student population on those campuses. We've been able to do that through the generosity of our supporters. Um, one that comes to mind is the William G. Pomeroy Foundation has supported that work in the tune of $800,000 in the past two years, which has allowed us to double um, the number of interns that we've had on HBCU campuses across the country. And what's really cool about that, Devin and um, Bill Pomeroy specifically, is he had a transplant almost 18 years ago. He's about to celebrate what we call his second 18th birthday. And um, he believes that the reason he was able to successfully get to transplant and have great outcomes is because he's white, because he's Caucasian. And he had several options on the registry, even 
18 years ago. And so ever since then, he's been paying it forward and funding initiatives that will help us diversify our donor registry. And since then, he has saved hundreds of lives because of the funding he's provided to this organization. So it's an incredible opportunity. And yes, Bill's unique, but we have many supporters um, across the country and in Mexico that help us fund this very critical work. So it's things like that, that allow us to be in places we otherwise wouldn't be. And by being in those places, we're able to serve patients we otherwise wouldn't serve. And we're able to grow our awareness in ways we otherwise wouldn't be able to grow it. But at the end of the day, it's about saving people's lives. I mean, we're in an organization that literally lives and breathes our mission every single day. We're not once removed from it. We're literally saving people's lives every day. In fact, I mean, right now, as we speak, there's at least 15 patients in the U.S. today that are waiting for the delivery of their second chance at life. They're waiting for a volunteer courier to arrive to their transplant center holding a blue cooler with life-saving bone marrow or life-saving stem cells in a bag to be delivered to them. Um, wow. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible to think about that. And that also means that there are 15 selfless, altruistic donors that donated today. Yeah. That answered the question. Yeah, yeah, that's a profound match, isn't it? It finding it really is. Yeah. That's a special kind of altruism, a special kind of generosity to uh, be willing to literally give a piece of yourself. Uh, now, <laughs> my my impression is it's not painless. Is it painless and I just don't know? Or yes. or a great question. We get asked that all the time. So um, almost 80% of the time, so the majority of the time um, when a donor donates, it is like a specialized blood donation. So maybe if you've ever given or seen someone donate plas plasma, um, it's very similar. And so for about a week prior to donation day, our donors receive a medication to boost up their stem cells. And then they go in and they get an IV in each arm. We take their blood out of one, spin it around in a machine, keep the things we need, their stem cells, and give everything right back to them. And so the procedure takes anywhere from four to eight hours usually. And then the donor is free to go and, you know, eat at Chipotle or whatever it is they want to do. <laughs> Um, most of our donors that donate that day go right back to work. Um, and then the small percentage of time, we still have donors who donate bone marrow. And that is an extraction from your hip. So it is a medical procedure um, and you're put under anesthesia. And most of our donors would tell you what it feels like after is they're sore they feel like either if you're from the north, you know, Minnesota, it feels like maybe you fell on the ice or something. And other donors will say it feels like you did a really heavy squat workout, like your your muscles are sore like that for, you know, a week or so after you donate. So I wouldn't say that it's painless. I've never done it. I've spoken to several donors who would say they would do it over again in a heartbeat. And they, because of, you know, the altruistic people they are, they always say what I went through is nothing compared to what the recipient or the patient went through. And so um, again, that is a great question. I wish more people would ask, um, quite frankly, instead of just making assumptions and maybe being scared of, of the unknown and then not joining the registry or not saying yes when we call. Well, this is truly inspiring, amazing work that you are doing and uh, kudos. Uh, 
What do you see as your superpower? <laughs> I've thought a lot about this in anticipation of this question. And of course, had to ask around a little bit what other people would consider my superpower. And what I have to agree with is I believe my superpower is a commitment to show up. Whether that means I'm showing up for my colleagues or my team, my family, a patient, their family, a donor, a benefactor, whatever the case may be. I believe that you only get one chance to show up, to really show up. And you can't blow it. You just can't. You don't know what's at stake a lot of the times, and maybe you do. But what is at stake shouldn't matter. What should matter is your commitment to others. And so I know that people have shown up for me. And I always want to be sure that that is um, an understanding that the people in my life can count on me to be there and committed to being there. Wow, that's that's a profound and powerful superpower. I, I wonder if you can think of an example of a time when you sort of demonstrated this superpower and had an outcome you can share with us. I was afraid you were going to ask that. I'll, <laughs> um, I'll be super vulnerable if that's okay. Um, this past year, I have led through something I've never led through before. And quite frankly, I never want to again. Um, one of my colleagues who was traveling for work um, was traveling with another colleague, a direct report of mine. And I got a call at about um, a little after midnight that there had been an emergency with um, my colleague's family. And I learned that um, my colleague's baby passed away oh. while they were um, traveling for work. His wife was home with the baby at the time. Um, <clears throat> and that's a call no one obviously wants to receive, but also one as a friend and as a colleague I had never received before. And so, you know, you just show up, you, you do what it is you need to do to get him home, um, to be sure that he and his wife have what they need to get through a time like this, and that he is confident that at this time, work doesn't matter. Like what matters most is that he can be where he needs to be and do what it is he needs to do and not have to worry about anything else. Um, I didn't do that alone, Devin, obviously. I mean, the team rallied around our colleague like never before. This organization continues to rally around our colleague. And um, I probably made several mistakes along the way. Um, but we worked through it. And over time, you know, he's back at work and he wants to be here. We check in often and have really honest and vulnerable conversations about the fact that if it is too hard of a day to be here, like we understand and we get it and we're all here to support him. And so, um, you know, being there, being at their house on, you know, the worst day possible for them, um, making sure they had what they need, just all the things I think any human would do with that dynamic of the, this person also being your colleague, um, is 
a time where I could say most recently I was there and wouldn't have been anywhere else to be honest. Yeah, that is a powerful example. Uh, moving as you work uh, as an executive <clears throat> at Be the Match, you are constantly in an opportunity to train and coach. And and I suspect that either directly or indirectly, formally or informally, one of the things you teach people is this principle of showing up to be there. And I wonder if you are now going to offer some advice to our audience for how to show up, what would you what would you tell them? I think my team gets tired of me talking about showing up honestly, but um, there was a, a story that I remind them of um, all the time. Anytime I'm talking to anyone about showing up, um, I share this story and I'm probably am not going to get it verbatim, Devin. So um, I apologize to um, the person who wrote it, but basically it was um, an individual who had cancer and it was terminal. And what he talked about was comparing of all things um, life and chances to going to a, a driving range and how you get a bucket of balls. And, you know, as you start swinging, you just hit the ball over and over and over, over again. You really don't think about it until you get down to those very few last balls. And then you really start to concentrate and you really start to pay attention to your form and, you know, your breaths and all of the things. And the point to that is, um, you know, not to wait to the end to, to be there and to make sure that you show up, but to think about showing up for every opportunity that you have and not just waiting until the end. And yes, it's a silly analogy, um, a bucket of golf balls, but you get the point, right? Um, you never know when someone needs you to show up. And so if it's just popping your head into someone's office or sending a text or, you know, not canceling a coffee date because you're too busy taking a meal to someone who needs it, whatever the case may be, don't miss the opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's profound. And I appreciate you sharing that, uh, that really is, I think, good, good counsel. And I, I love the analogy. I love the analogy because uh, I'm a terrible golfer, but <laughs> I have I have spent a lot of time hitting buckets of balls. And I, I yeah, I connect with that think, story. Right? There's right. You, you got 50 balls to hit. And it's only the last five that you think, oh, yeah, I got to get serious now. There are only a few balls. There. Yeah. And you miss 45 chances to really be thoughtful uh about your swing and all which is why i never got any, any better at golf <laughs> don't <Me> listen <laughs> yeah. joy thank you very much for taking the time to be with us before we wrap up i wonder if you would take a minute and just tell people how they can learn more about be the match how they can sign the registry and become a candidate donor and what that involves and and then uh, how people can donate or otherwise engage with you. And, and some, of course, will want to connect with you personally. So if you have a, a preferred way for that to happen, please let us know. Sure. Thanks for asking. So both to join the registry or give a, a, a gift, it's super easy. Just go to be the match.org. And if you are eligible to join the registry, click join. And if you'd like to um, financially contribute, click give or both either or either. Um, we appreciate it all. You, you literally could be saving someone's life. Um, and the best way to contact me is probably via email. And so my email address is J-K-I-N-G, the number two. So J King two at nmdp.org, which stands for National Marrow Donor Program. 
So jking2 at nmdp.org. And I'd welcome to talk to anyone who is willing to have a conversation. Fantastic. Well, uh, Joy, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing so openly your thoughts and experiences. Uh, we we want to see you uh, succeed in your efforts, and I'm especially excited, as I think you are, about the, the shift possible from your research in uh, making donor matches uh, more available to uh, our African-American friends. So uh, we 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 wish you all the success in the world. Thank you, Devin. I really appreciate the opportunity to share our story um, on your podcast too. I mean, what you do, it matters. And the listeners will, you know, if it's just one person that decides to join and, and gets called as a donor, will save another life. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the amazing work you do as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, let's do some good. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show. Twice each week, we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.